My name is Wayne Johnson. Welcome to the seventh episode of Point Pod. Lauza said that excellence, like water, benefits everything without struggle. Now we're always trying to make things better. And in making things better, we find that there are many things in our road that would tend to stop us from reaching our goals. The idea of a struggle, the Chinese character that Jung, that means struggle, the one of its earliest forms, looks like there's two people uh, contending with each other in some fairly extreme combat. A later form, uh, still ancient, uh, shows a, a claw-like hand and another hand uh, in competition with each other. And the more modern form, it seems that one of the hands has acquired a weapon of some sort, and the other claw-like hand is still continuing, still contending. And then the modern form claw on the top is still remaining. We can see the claw, we can see the hand, and we can see the weapon that is still there. Laozi is saying that real excellence is making its way without this sort of struggle, that it is providing altruistic benefit that we all are interested in seeing take place, but it's it's doing it without a great deal of uh, struggle. There's not really the contentious wrangling that's uh, occurring. I think it's the the wrangling part of contention is the is the thing. He goes on to say that water is dwelling. It, it's not like that it's um, exactly uh, not there anymore. It's still uh, it's still present. It's dwelling, and it's dwelling even though uh, men are rejecting it. It's still uh, there. It's still making itself available. Excellence is still doing its thing. And so is like the real way. It's like the true way. He continues with some direct application of excellence. And excellence is, is really the ability to do good. We want to see good things happen. We want to see we want to see goodness. We want to see beauty. The word the word that means goodness here is uh, is very close to the word that that means beauty. So goodness in a good dwelling considers the location, and this is not just only the place where we live, but this is the place where we put ourselves, where we put our effort. A perfected mind seeks depth. A good giving follows the way of of heaven. Now, this is an interesting thing also. The giving here, the you giving, it shows a three-cornered, a three-part heavenly object and a three-part earthly object reaching up toward the heavenly object. And the heavenly object is giving impartially, impartial giving without particular interest that we can see. Heaven gives life, it gives rain, it gives sunshine. These are all all the gifts that are coming from above, what we might say the God-given gifts. There's another sort of giving that he mentions, similar sound, a different character. This is the the giving that, that people do among themselves. This is the togetherness, the giving together, the fellowship. We have a, we have hands holding up a basket and then things that are provided uh, mutually with kindness and benevolence. This is the sharing together. This is all in the context of, of goodness, excellence, of getting something done. The good fellowship is kind and benevolent. In speech, be true. If we're not straight up with one another, how can we know what to do? What fellowship is with there between darkness and light? In ruling, be just and orderly. In daily life, uh, be competent. So we, we expect competency from others, and we need to be competent ourselves. And in action, be aware of the timing, the right timing for things. It can be the difference between success and failure, the timing. Laozi finishes, he says that the honorable do not strive, but they persist. He's not saying that they give up. 
he's saying that they persist. They persist without fault, without error, but they don't wrangle. They do no harm. The father of medicine, Hippocrates, a Greek physician, who lived a more or less at about the same time as, as Lao Tzu, according to the, the legend. More or less, he was a contemporary, maybe a little bit after Lao Tzu. There is a Hippocratic oath that is named after Hippocrates. We credit the statement, first of all, do no harm. We credit this to Hippocrates. Some of the people in the medical profession don't really like this idea, and they try to find ways to discredit Hippocrates. But what did Hippocrates actually say? He said, I will enter to help the sick, and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm. That was part of the Hippocratic Oath. It may have been written after Hippocrates, but we can find for sure that it was part of what Hippocrates was teaching, because we have his epidemics is still uh, still extant from 2,500 years ago. We still have the actual writings of Hippocrates. We can read them today. It's in Greek and a translation of this line from Epidemics. He said, in regard to diseases, I will strive for two things, to, to be of benefit and to do no harm. Now, some people have said that Hippocrates said, first of all, do no harm. Well, it appears that perhaps he first said that, first of all, he would be a benefit. And perhaps, secondly, he would do no harm. But it's, uh, I think it's close enough that, uh, that he said that he would uh, do no harm. It, uh, if you would want to say it was first, if you want to say it was second, it certainly it was very, very important to Hippocrates in the things that he was doing that he would do no harm, and it's uh, appropriate for for doctors and veterinarians and those who are involved in the treatment of animals and the handling of animals to, first of all, do no harm. Do no harm to the animals. Do no harm to the people. Thomas Sydenham was considered to be the English Hippocrates. He was a great physician, and he did a lot of writing and a lot of exposition about medicine. He was considered to be the rival of Hippocrates, the emulous Hippocrates, the rival of Hippocrates, but not necessarily rival that they were contending with each other, but a rival in terms of he approximated Hippocrates. He was uh, very close to being as great as he, Hippocrates. Certainly, he emulated him. He didn't copy him, but he lived and he taught much in the way that Hippocrates did. There's a difference between uh, copying and emulation. We want, to, we want to emulate great people, but we don't necessarily need to copy them. He was quoted by Thomas Inman a few years after his death. He was quoted as saying that for the first thing is that no harm is done, that uh, Inman wrote it in Latin, uh, primus est ut non nocere, the first of all, do no harm. So perhaps the first person to say, first of all, do no harm was Thomas Inman, but he was quoting after uh, Thomas Sydenham, and certainly the ideas of not doing any harm originated with Hippocrates certainly a good idea. Thomas Inman lived in the 1800s, 100 years after Thomas Sydenham, and he wrote a couple of famous books. Uh, the One of them that went, made two editions was Foundation for a New Theory and Practice of Medicine, which the second edition was published in 1861. And he quoted Thomas Sydenham that in Latin, first of all, do no harm. And he said that we believe that the principle of doing evil that good may come is as false in medicine as it is in ethics. We cannot do evil that good may come. 
Thomas Inman was striking out at some of the medical practices of the time. Drugs that were used had particularly low therapeutic index that they were almost as likely to kill you as they were to cure you, and the dose that it took to cure you was likely the dose that it would take to kill you. And there were several prominent people who were destroyed by some imprudent applications of medication, and Thomas Edman struck out against that and uh, quoted uh, Sydenham and, uh, first of all, do no harm. So the idea of benefit versus harm, first of all, we should consider the benefit of doing something as opposed to the harm that would occur if we didn't do anything. The negative result of non-intervention is certainly a concern, the failure to act. And then we've got the matter of the benefit versus the risk, the negative outcome of intervention. And we've got as much of a chance sometimes as a chance of harm coming from doing nothing as we have a chance for of harm coming from doing something. Of course, the uh, way the society goes, the way that people think, quite often they feel that they're better off to do nothing and not be blamed than to uh, to do something and be blamed for for doing uh, for doing something. Alza didn't exactly tell us to do nothing. He told us to persist in doing good. But indeed, first of all, do no harm. We cannot do evil that good may come. And is there any possible positive outcome from intervention? One of the things that can be done is we consider the cost of the problem, and we consider the cost of a possible solution. And if the cost of the problem is greater than the cost of a possible solution, Perhaps we should give it a try. We should go for it if it uh, seems like that there's a of a possibility that the solution would be cheaper than the problem. Now there are some diseases for which the cost of the solution is greater than the cost of the problem. Hemorrhagic bowel syndrome and growing and finishing pigs. It kill a pig every now and then. The cost of that problem is very easily calculated, but the cost of the treatment, which is usually a fairly high dose of Tylosin, Tylosin is not particularly cheap. It will stop the problem, but the cost of the Tylosin could be more than the cost of the problem. And so here we've got a dilemma in terms of how we should manage the disease in terms of the cost of a problem and the cost of the solution. Of course, in terms of saving a human life, it's not the same. But a pig, we talking about pure economic value. Of course, there's the loss of productivity and all this sort of thing, genetics value, and all these things that could be added in. And of course, there are market factors which are changing all the time. And what is the risk of harm? Can we estimate the risk? Well, sometimes we can. What are the cost of the untoward reactions that uh, we go in and we vaccinate uh, a thousand sows? Uh, there's no doubt that uh, you were going to have a few of them abort as a result of just messing with them. You would just went in and some of them you just went in and gave them uh, normal saline. Uh, some of them will abort just from messing with them. There could be some untoward reactions, particularly if the animals are deficient in vitamin E and selenium. We could see some untoward reactions. And so what is the risk of harm? What is the cost of doing nothing? And of course, if we don't vaccinate the gilts against Japanese encephalitis, we could understand that we could have a great deal of trouble. If we didn't vaccinate against parvovirus, that could be serious enough risk of a few untoward reactions is not a big deal whenever we consider that the risk of the disease is pretty obvious. What is the therapeutic index? The therapeutic index is the ratio between the amount of the medicine that will cause a negative reaction every time and the amount of the medicine 
that it takes to uh, to get you well. And there are some drugs that have very poor therapeutic index. And so some highly specialized drugs have very poor therapeutic index. They will make you sick. And indeed, in some people with weak situations, uh, they the drug may actually end up being what actually takes you out. And, you know, what is the, uh, what is the risk of uh, serious, uh, chronic, uh, serious chronic disease? Serious chronic disease might result from, from some kinds of treatment. What is the harm to the society from the treatment? What is the harm to the environment if uh, we end up making a treatment and it creates a, uh, a number of uh, a serious birth defects among children? Uh, that could be very, very devastating. We've got some horrible examples of this kind of thing. Or damage to the environment. There's some drugs that are hard in the environment. Some medications, uh, some pesticides uh, persist in the environment for a long time. What is the harm to the markets if we are using certain drugs? Uh, a good example of this would be arsenic acid. Arsenic acid is arsenic. It sounds terrible. And so the people uh, don't like the idea that we're feeding arsenic acid, although it is a was a um, highly effective and venerable drug. The fact that it contained arsenic was not too big of a deal, actually, because it wasn't like you're really poisoning the animals with arsenic. It was one of the early uh, drugs, and it was used for more than 150 years uh, very effectively. It seemed to be harmful to the market, and so it uh, seemed good to those who had control of such things to take arsenic acid out off the market, wanting to show a favor to those who felt that the regulators were not sig significantly concerned or sufficiently concerned. What about harm to the workers? Um, are we doing things that might be harmful to the workers on the farm? Are we ex exposing the workers to certain treatments, uh, things that they might come in contact with? And, you know, for example, things like you know brucellosis strain 19 uh, vaccine. If you accidentally inject that into your into yourself, uh, it could cause you some uh, fairly serious or at least significant problems. Not sure exactly how terribly serious, but it's uh, certainly uh, uh, significant. The vaccine against ORF certainly will infect uh, people and can cause a very a painful lesion, although it's uh, somewhat temporary. Let us consider deliberate exposure of personnel to chemical disinfectants. What is the purpose of exposing workers to a chemical disinfectant? Uh, if we have uh, 24 hours of downtime and no pig exposure, and uh, 48 hours downtime after some known pig exposure or an unknown status of a worker, do we need to uh, go with any further than that? Is that uh, is isn't that sufficient? I think that the the data shows that it is certainly sufficient for even for ASF for foot and mouth disease for PERS for all the things that we're concerned about. A forty eight hour downtime for those of who have been in contact with pigs is certainly long enough. But we don't really need to do anything else. Hand washing and skin disinfection uh, with, you know, iodine, maybe some quaternary ammonium salts, chlorhexidine, uh, chlorophores. Now, these things will kill the simple vegetative forms of bacteria. The hand washing itself will certainly dramatically reduce the incidence of viruses if they happen to be on the hands. Uh, we can glove people if we're worried about uh, viruses on the hands. Body disinfection. Well, normal bathing will get rid of a lot of things. If we're more concerned than that, we can have people bathe in a tub to make sure that we get the whole body uh, properly wet. Uh, some people have gone as far, however, as to uh, suggest a to total body disinfection. And at first, whenever we started to hear about this, we felt that it was kind of a joke that we saw some uh, 
some pictures of uh, some movies of somebody getting into a tub of what appeared to be uh, some disinfectant, maybe Vercon or something like that. But then later, we actually, we were appalled to find out that there were actually people doing these, uh, these kinds of things. Now, some of this sort of things we had been aware of for quite some time. And in the context of, first of all, do no harm, and in terms of the context of being of benefit, we need to look at this very carefully. If we're considering the antiviral disinfectants, we're talking about significantly more powerful chemicals than if we're killing the simple vegetative forms of bacteria. Among the antiviral disinfectants are the oxidizers. Uh, the oxidizers generally will kill the virus in about 10 minutes. Uh, PMPS, peroxymonosulfate, is a very effective uh, disinfectant. Uh, there are a few different brand names, one of which is Vercon. Hydrogen peroxide is also a oxidizer, and if it's an adequate strength, it will be an effective disinfectant. Strong hydrogen peroxide is often used in the laboratory as a disinfectant and cleaner to get rid of uh, the DNA and RNA in the laboratory. The aldehydes can kill the ASF virus in about 30 minutes, and among those are glutaraldehyde, Wartran. Glutaraldehyde is a fairly effective disinfectant. It is a fixative as well. It will, like formaldehyde, it is a anatomical fixative. And we wouldn't imagine exposing people to formaldehyde, but uh, we don't seem to be that concerned sometimes about exposing people to glutaraldehyde, which is doing essentially the same thing. It's the same, uh, really the same thing as formaldehyde. It's just uh, got a longer carbon chain on it. The phenols uh, will work in about an hour. We have orthophenolphenol and chlorophenol. And of course, the strong alkali agents, uh, 2% uh, sodium hydroxide, a calcium oxide, and calcium hydroxide are among the alkaline agents. The risk to personnel of exposure to Chemical disinfectants, uh, first of all, contact allergies. Some people are sensitive, uh, skin sensitivity, uh, lung damage uh, by aspiration, the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, glutaraldehyde at a half of a ppm will cause certainly respiratory lesions. Some individuals are sensitive to 0.5 ppm. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is common among nurses using glutaraldehyde, bleach, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, and quaternary ammonium compounds in hospitals. It certainly is a occupational hazard. Peroxymonosulfate has a very low oral toxicity for humans, but it is very toxic to fish. It can cause skin and respiratory irritation, severe eye damage, skin rash, eczema, which is a skin disease, asthma, lung edema, airway disease, headache, nausea, dizziness, weakness, reactive airways dysfunction syndrome, cumulative effects with repeated exposure. The product label for peroxymonosulfate requires protective clothing, rubber gloves, goggles, face shields, and safety glasses, and thorough washing, including clothing after handling this material. It is a dangerous substance. Things that can kill viruses are anti-biological agents. They're biocidal things, and humans are living and certainly can be damaged by them also. The phenolic disinfectants are actually pretty nasty. They can cause eye damage, uh, very serious liver and kidney damage from the phenol groups, lung and throat irritation, again, headache, dizziness, tremors, nausea, seizures, coma, death, uh, chronic health effects from exposure to 
phenolic disinfectants, they should be managed with respect. Per acetic acid, we don't, uh, I don't consider it uh, very much, but some people, uh, some people use it. Uh, it is uh, also uh, a, a toxic uh, substance. Uh, it is considered to be, uh, all, I have all these danger warnings on the label. Uh, it can, can, may intensify fire. It could be harmful if swallowed, harmful if inhaled, harmful if in contact with skin, can cause severe skin burns and eye damage, may cause respiratory irritation, and is toxic to aquatic life uh, with uh, with long-lasting effects on uh, on these things. Uh, if 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 it's on the skin, uh, the it should be immediately removed. If in the eye, it's uh, very dangerous. It is a corrosive compound and should be handled with great respect. Uh, glutaraldehyde, this is the uh, typical label for glutaraldehyde for Wu Archan. Uh, for eye contact, you should be flushed with large amounts of water. Uh, skin contact, remove the contaminated clothing and wash the contaminated skin with large amounts of water. Um, avoid inhaling it. Uh, inhaling glutaraldehyde can inter irritate the nose, throat, and lungs, can cause headache, nausea, and vomiting, can cause skin allergy, and an asthma-like allergy. Uh, there are very, very low levels of permitted exposure for glutaraldehyde. It is considered to be a strong poison. So what are we doing when we are putting people in these rooms and we're fogging them with uh, with disinfectants. Certainly in the Western countries, this wouldn't be heard of because uh, you would be sued by the, uh, by <laughs> almost immediately if you tried to do this kind of thing to, uh, to workers. Uh, it's really incredible that uh, the, uh, that we see people trying to, uh, trying to fog people with uh, with disinfectants. Certainly, if you're going to come in contact with these disinfectants, uh, you might go as so far as to say we actually need a hazmat suit. And so if you're going to stand somebody inside there, have them put their hazmat suit on first, and then you can have them stand there as long as uh, as long as you like. In summary, the deliberate use of disinfectants on personnel, it really does fail the, first of all, do no harm test. There really isn't any significant benefit associated with this other than to the psychology of people who think that they're getting something done. There really are no disinfectants that can kill the ASF virus rapidly that are safe for use on human bodies or by fog exposure. All of the strong disinfectants should be used with personal protective equipment as instructed by the product label. The good news is that showering and downtime and clothing changes makes the disinfection of people unnecessary for animal herd protection. We just don't need to do it. Thank you very much.